Tonight we're going to look in Romans chapter 11, verses 11 to 24. Maybe we'll get beyond that, but I'm not rushing. But we're going to see what should be our attitude toward Israel. And, you know, think about how that can apply in our world today and attitudes toward Israel. Bad attitudes towards Israel is often called anti Semitism, right? Or being anti Semitic. Has that been a problem in history? In the church? So, this, I believe, is God's inspired word on what should be our attitude toward Israel. And going to the end of the chapter, will Israel be saved? Does God still have a plan and program for national Israel? How should that affect our attitude? And our compassion for Israel today. So, as a nation, as a people, right, as a nation. And of course, that has to extend to the individual Jewish people that we may know <laughs> because they are of Israel. So, let's, we already prayed. So, we'll look in Romans chapter 11 and begin at verse 11. And if we could kind of stick with us here, so we can start, we'll start right with Christy, Esther, and go around this way like that. Start at verse 11. We'll go down to verse 24. We can each read a verse. Okay, Sister Christy. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles, so to provoke them to jealousy. Though the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. Okay, go ahead. Verse 13. Uh, chapter 11, verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the, the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my honor. If by any means I may promote to emulation them which are of my flesh, in my sake some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the word of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruits be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the roots be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them become a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. So I won't say then, the branches be broken off, that I might be grafted. Okay, Christy? Verse 20. Okay. Uh, well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thus stands by faith. Do not have my interest to you. For if God spared the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not you. We know therefore the goodness and severity of God, on them which fell severity, for to what thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Okay, so we'll stop right there. So let's look at the Gentiles' attitude, the nation's attitude toward Israel. So this word Gentile, and we see it in verse 11, we see it in verse 12, and then we see it in verse number 13. And then that's a special verse because Paul says, I speak to you Gentiles, and you, you should really listen to me pretty well, because I am the apostle to the Gentiles. Now that word Gentiles is... The original language word is ethnos. So what word 
is from our English vocabulary, ethnic, ethnicity, it's that idea. So that word ethnos is, and ethnic, I like that word, you know, um, and I like the word Gentile. When I see that word Gentile, I, I actually get excited, you know, because it's talking about the nations. It's talking about everybody and anybody who's not Jewish. And God has a special apostle to the Gentiles. He wrote 13, 14 books in the New Testament. And why do we say that Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles? Why do we say that? Why does he say that? I am the apostle to the Gentiles. He doesn't say an apostle. I am the I am the one, the special apostle, the special one to the to the emissary. I'm a special emissary to the ethnic peoples of the world. Why do you think? Well, that's where he was called. His first call, and then they confirmed that when the apostles all got together. Right when they, they all did get together, and when he was so when he was first called, the Lord said to him, "Go your way." Or, or the Lord said to Ananias to tell Paul, go your way. He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. So that was rooted in that very Damascus call. And then remember when he gave his testimony, I actually read this today. I, I read Acts 22 today in my devotions. When he get, gives his testimony, they're like listening, 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 listening. And guess when they really get mad at him? Acts 22 and verse 21, Acts 22, 21, he said, and then he said to me, depart. This is the Lord saying to me, I will send you far hence unto the, and look at the next verse. And when they, they, they listened to him until he said that, that was the, that was the boiling point. They were like, <laughs> you know, and they went ballistic. That's, this is why the Jewish people in his day really despised Paul and followed him from one city. He would leave one city and the Jewish leaders would follow him to the next city and turn the people in that city against him. And, but yet Paul loved the Jewish people and had such a passion for them to be saved. But, but and he was Jewish, and so, of course, he wanted Jewish people to be saved. But yet, God gave him a special calling to go to the Gentile people. And he often did that. So he would go into the Jewish synagogue, and what would happen? They would kick him out, and he would go, then where would he go? He would go to the Gentiles. Now, look at this verse. Look at Acts. This is uh, actually this is an important verse, too. Acts 13. And this is in one of those situations where Paul was on, the, you know, doing his thing with Barnabas on the first missionary journey and they're preaching and the Jewish people were so filled with wrath, envy, it says, and they started blaspheming him. And Paul and Barnabas said in verse 46, Acts 13, verse 46, they said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you, judge yourselves and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. That's from Isaiah 49, verse 6. So why did Paul, too, believe that going to the Gentiles was the right thing? God told him to, but it was rooted where? In the Old Testament, what, did God promise he was going to save Gentiles? Yes. yes, he did. And so God was being faithful to his promise. But now here's the next question. Does God promise that he's going to be faithful to Israel and that he has a plan and program for Israel? Yes. So Paul believed both of those things. And so should we. You know, who, who, did, who did Paul want to see saved? Jewish people or Gentiles? Everybody. That's right. Everybody. Remember the passage in 1 Corinthians 9 where it's like, to the Jew, I became like a Jew. To the 
to the one without the law, I became as if without the law. I wasn't going to put the one without the law under the law. To the Jew, I'm going to respect the law. I'm going to become all things to all men. Why? That I might be all my, I might be able to save some. And that, and that, that's the same thing what he says here about the Jewish people. He wanted to see Jewish people saved. And so he's writing to the Jewish people. And he's talked about this idea that I might provoke the Jewish people to envy, to emulation. That's in verse 14. He says, them which are my flesh. So he's talking about actual Jewish people who are born of the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then he says that, that they might, and might save some of them. Just like what Mark said to me today, he heard a message and the, the preacher said, Do you, does it matter to you if your bus driver is saved? That's how what he said, what, what is it, hell or not? Or if he's going to hell or not? Yeah. You know, I, that's good. That's good because we should care about our dry cleaner that he's saved if he's going to hell or not. And we should care about our bus driver if you see that same bus driver every day, that we might be able to see some saved. Paul wanted Jewish people saved. So he's dealing with the Gentile attitude towards the, the Jewish people. And what he's afraid of here, in a sense, I'm looking at my notes, I'm on page 10, second bullet point down. Paul's afraid the Gentiles will make the same error as Israel did and fall into religious pride and be broken off out of the, you know, be broken off out of the, out of the olive tree as Israel had been. So in this segment, Paul is challenging Gentiles to have a proper attitude toward Israel. As in past history, there's always a danger of the world's nations despising Jewish people. I mean, just think of what is how people have treated Jewish people throughout history. And forgetting the source and channel of their own spiritual blessings. So he says, I speak to you Gentiles in as much as I am an apostle of Gentiles. I magnify my office. So what are some of the attitudes that we should have toward the nation of Israel. The first one, number one now, is to be mindful of your responsibility. Be mindful of your responsibility. So what is our responsibility as Gentiles to Jewish people? What should we actually think? I, I'm going to try to do this. What is he saying? In verse 11 and also verse 14. End of verse 11, verse 14. What, what does Paul say? We have a responsibility to do this. Colleen? Yeah, provoke. Now, how in the world? What, what in the world is he talking about now? To provoke them <laughs> to jealousy. And verse 14, same words, really. To provoke them to emulation. And that's the same word, jealousy. So... There are three words here that speak of Israel's rejection of the Messiah in verse 11. So let's let's just go through this. Verse 11. Have they stumbled that they should fall? Who's the they there? Who's the they? Israel. Israel stumbled. And that, have they stumbled that they should fall? In other words, completely away from God, never to return. And he says... May it never be, God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So their fall is temporary, not permanent. And through their fall, through the Gentile, through, through Israel rejecting, what did Paul say? You reject, where am I going to go? I'm going to go to the Gentiles. So the Gentiles are going to get a fuller hearing of this gospel message. Yeah. yeah, we should be thankful and mindful. Yeah, that, that's, that's one thing for sure. So he says that their fall, and then that's one word he uses. Verse 12, he says, now if the fall of them be the, the riches of the world and the diminishing, that word diminishing is another word, like their defeat of them, the riches of the Gentile, how much more their fullness so when he says that Israel has fallen, what has that led us to be? Rich. Are we rich? 
So in, in a sense, you ever see a rich person say, wow, I wish I could have what they had. I wish I could drive that car. Wow, look at that bag that girl had. She has a really nice bag. But I know where she bought that. I can't afford that bag, you know? I remember when I was on the Isle of Palms back years ago, we were driving down the beach boulevard and seeing all these beautiful beachfront houses. I was like, wow, wow, it'd be so nice owning one of these houses, you know? And you just, you kind of, you don't want to be covetous, but you, you got eyes and you could see it would be nice to have that, you know? Whatever. Whether you emulate a athlete or somebody who has some kind of talent that you would like to have, whatever. I mean, we all feel that. So that's what he's saying. That's how we should make the Jewish people feel. That we have something that they wish they could have. And how do you play that out? <laughs> okay. That? How do you, what? How do you, what? What's the practical application of that? What do we have? What we we have to live rich, Thank you, and I'm not talking about <laughs> I'm not talking about because you know some people do like money more than other people, but nevertheless, you know I'm not saying that we just open up our wallet and so when I get a twenty dollar bill, I'm going to make it all single, so make it look like I have a lot of money. <laughs> I, I think when I say we have to live rich, I'm not saying that we we flaunt, but that we are we have a spiritual wealth to us. In Christ, that in, in Christ are we rich? God has chosen the poor of this world to be what? Rich in faith. He became poor that we through his poverty might be rich. So whether we have a lot of this world's goods or not, in the spiritual sense, it doesn't matter. If you have Christ, are you rich? Okay, so we have to know what we have in Christ. One, And I think that's one, if we don't provoke either the Jewish people or anyone else to that, to want what we have, then we're not living out those riches. And I don't, I'm sure I, we don't do it the way, I know I don't do it the way I should, right? Don't agree with me, so yeah, you know. But uh, no, <laughs> we could all live that, live Christ better, you know? We can all be, we are growing into his image. But I think that's the idea, to provoke them to jealousy. So letter A, Israel's rejection has turned into riches for the Gentiles. Paul went to the Gentiles after the Jews rejected his message. There's that verse. You might want to circle that verse because we did look it up. Acts 13, which is a quote from Isaiah 49. Israel's refusal of the gospel allowed the salvation message to be made to the Gentiles even more abundant. And number three. Gentiles were to provoke the Jews to jealousy and that they ought to live in such a way so that the Jewish people will desire what they have, verse 11, to provoke them to jealousy, that they would desire what they have. Verse number four there, let me just keep reading this. Jealousy and emulation is the same word. Parazelo, uh, para so we get our word zealous from that, like being zealous. That's from the, this Greek root. Zealous is the idea of envy, a desire, you know, having a zeal. The Gentiles should stir among the Jewish people a deep sense of need, a deep sense of need to believe on the Messiah. Gentiles should cause a burning passion for the Jewish people to see their responsibility to turn for, to Christ. Okay, let me just uh, read through this section, then we could stop and... If, and then try to um, take your thoughts as well. But verses 12 through 14, diminishing, speaks of the reality that the failure, the loss, the crushing defeat, that's what the word diminishing in verse 12. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing, the defeat of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. Now, that's interesting. How much more their fullness. There's a day coming where Israel will be fully saved. Paul's building to that. So he's saying here that if Gentiles are being saved while Israel has been defeated, how much more will Gentiles be saved when Israel is being saved? That's what, that's what he's saying. And, and just hold on to that because that's in the book of Revelation. When Israel is saved in the tribulation, there's going to be a worldwide Although there's many people who are still rebellious against the Lord and following the Antichrist, there's going to be a worldwide 
revival amongst Gentiles when Israel comes to know Christ. So, so he's saying, if their fall be to our riches, how much more their, their fullness? So Paul's getting to that. He's, he's just starting to lay this foundation. But then verse 13, I speak to you Gentiles in as much as I'm the apostle of the Gentile. Okay, so um, in our notes, the wealth and riches that the Gentiles have experienced should result, I'm on page 11, in the Jewish people wanting what the Gentiles have. And number six, the phrase, how much more their fullness in verse 12, that I just emphasized, relates to the fact that the ultimate salvation of Israel during the tribulation and then experienced throughout the millennium will lead to even greater blessing to the Gentile nations of the world. And think of that. Think of the nations of the world during the millennium. Will people need to be saved during the millennium? Yes. And Jesus Christ will rule and reign in Jerusalem and the nations of the world will come to the temple and it will lead to the salvation of, of many, 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 many. So there's going to, so when Israel in its fullness, beginning the tribulation and then into the millennium, the Gentile nations will, will come to, to the Lord. But here's the point. And get it back to Mark's comment earlier you know how do we how do we do that how do we and shouldn't we how do we even think about this so israel has rejected the lord as a nation have they thwarted god have they thwarted his plan have they thwarted god's plan no god's plan is being worked out now what should be our desire to live Christ to live rich in Christ live our riches so that others will see Jesus in us see a, the power of a transformed life of, of the spirit of God transforming us and then seeing others drawn to the Lord so, so that some might be saved, as it says in verse 14, and might save some of them, that I might provoke them to emulation. Now, how can we provoke Jewish people to emulation? How, do we, how can we work that out? Having a hope, having a strength, having a, a belief, having no fear, having a sound mind. Okay. Integrity. Okay. Having the anointing of God present. God is at work. God is, you know, and, and in this, it couldn't, it, you know, obviously the context here is Jewish people, and there are many Jewish people in our city. Somebody has said like one out of every eight people we pass on the street is, is Jewish. And we should love the Jewish people because these are people who have suffered nationally from their inception as a nation and God has used them to bring us the word of God. And God has used them as a nation to bring us the son of God. That Jesus Christ was born of Israel. He was Jewish. So we should have a deep respect for the Jewish people. And we should be mindful of our responsibility. And, and, and that we have a richness in Christ. And... Um, Uh, well, as well, even to unsaved people that were around, our family who doesn't know the Lord. And just living Christ, that God is real, God is at work in our lives. You know, and, and I, I think what I get from this passage, and especially at verse 14, when I thought that I, I thought about what Paul said there, where he says, and might save some. Of them. I really like that. You know, and I did think of that first Corinthians 9 passage where he says that, you know, if if by any means that some might be saved, you know, and look at look at uh go, go to that passage in First Corinthians. There's actually another one too. First Corinthians 9, 22. And here he's talking about all kinds of people. 
Jew or Gentile, those with the law, those without the law, those strong, those weak. In 1 Corinthians 9, 22. Esther, could you please read that for us? To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I have made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. That was a motivation for Paul, that I might by all means save some. Look at the end of chapter 10, last verse. And this is right after he said those famous words, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory. glory of God. And so we live to the glory of God. That's one way to provoke them to jealousy. Not giving offense. He says in verse 32, neither to the Jews. Notice his categories here of people. The Jews, the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Interesting. And the church of God is made up of who? Just Gentiles? Just Jews? Jews and Gentiles. So here I think he's saying, I don't want to give offense. Here is categories. There's two kinds of ethnic people in the world, so to speak. There's Gentiles, all the, all the nations, and there's Jewish people. In Paul's thing. Okay? But now there's the church on earth. So the church is made up of who? Jews and, but what kind of Jews and Gentiles? Saved. So here I think he's saying Jews, those with, who aren't saved. Gentiles, those who aren't saved. And the church, those who are saved. So I don't want to offend anyone. So how does he bring that up, though? Well, verse 33. Okay, read that verse. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. That they may be saved. There it is again, that they may be saved. That some might be saved. But you, I think right there, bringing Amen. glory to God, living for his glory, not for myself, not giving an offense, and then trying to please people. You know, in, in not in the sense that I'm going to please people and not please God, but I will, I will please people in such a way that pleases God. <laughs> you know, what Paul said, I won't, if, I, if I live to please men, I can't, you know, be a servant of Christ. He said that at one place, but yet he said in Romans, he did say in Romans, and that's interesting, he lives to please people. What does it say in Romans 15, 2? Let every one of us please who? Please who? Romans 15, 2. Please his neighbor. And, the, and actually, perhaps we should have read verse 1, where he says, we then that are strong ought to bear the, the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. So the idea there is we don't live for ourselves. We live... Loving God and loving our, our neighbor and to please our neighbor for his good, to try to do good things. Jesus Christ didn't live for himself. He sought to please others, you know, and doing good. So I think that's how to do it. Yeah. I was listening to somebody who teaches in seminary students about the history of Jews. And he said, And then so it speaks volumes to them if we do that to God help them as opposed to help them. You know, you think about that. That I believe is true historically. One of the reasons why Jewish people will say we can never become a Christian is because how? Because why? How have they been treated by so-called Christians? You know, in the Crusades, going back even to the Crusades, when the Roman, and really it's not the true Christians who would do that, but in the name of Christianity, they have been severely, severely treated. And it's tragic. Because look what look what's actually in the Bible. <laughs> we should look. 
live in such a way that, that we will please them, do good to them, and live in such a way rich before them in Christ so that they will want what we have. God help us. We need the power of God for that. So, all right, uh, verse, verses uh, 14 and 15. That letter B should really be uh, 14 and 15, not 15 and 16. Uh, letter B, I'm on page 11. That should be... Okay, um, yeah, letter B is of verse 14 and 15, and, and it is Israel's rejection has turned into reconciliation for the Gentiles. And we're on page 11. That's letter B. Reconciliation means to change attitude from hostility to friendship. Okay, so verse 14, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? So again, he uses these terms. Israel has fallen. Israel has been diminished. That's in verse 12. And now they've been cast away, verse 15. But then he also says that... There's coming a time of fullness for Israel, and they will be as alive from the dead in verse 15. So again, he's, he's building up. He, you know what he's building up to? Verse 26. I'll just say that right now. He's building up to verse 26. What does it say? So all Israel shall be saved. There's coming a time of fullness for Israel. There's coming a time where they will be as like a nation. You, we think they're dead, but remember the prophecy of Ezekiel, the prophecy of the vision of dry bones, the dead bones, and that those dead bones are given life. That is Israel not going back. Just Israel is not alive in that sense today, even though they are a, a nation, but they will come to Christ. Okay, so letter B is now not only should we be mindful of our responsibility, but we should be humble in our attitude, humble in our attitude, and really thankful as well. Because, you know, remember how Paul talked about how without Christ as Gentiles, we were without God in the world? He says that in Ephesians chapter 2. We were without God. We had no hope. We were, our, 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 our fool's heart was darkened. We were... What does it say? Barbarians. You know, I was definitely barbar barbaric, you know. Uh, we were barbarians. We, were, we had no hope as Gentiles. But look what Jesus said. Je you know, Jesus even prophesied that Gentiles will be saved. And actually, his first, his first message he gave, remember why they tried to push him off the cliff in, in Nazareth? Remember he, he spoke? He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel. And, and so forth. And then he gave illustrations from the Old Testament. He said, yeah, there were a lot of uh, lepers in the days of Elijah, but guess who God sent to, or in the days of Elisha, but there was one leper that God healed, and who was he? That Syrian war general, a Gentile. And he says, yeah, there were a lot of widows in the days of Elijah, but God sent Elijah to that widow where? Not in Israel, in Zero, they weren't Gentiles, both Gentiles. That's what got the Jewish people upset at Jesus, that he's saying he's come even for Gentiles. But in Matthew chapter 8, look what Jesus says here. And he's talking here about the Roman centurion who had great faith. The Roman, not a Jew. He said, I have not seen, I've not seen such great faith in Israel. Roman, uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 10. And verse 11 and 12 
Uh, Bailey, could you please read those verses for us? Yes, Matthew chapter 8, verse 11 and 12. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, so many will come from the east and the west. So that's talking about the nations. East and West in relationship to what? <laughs> to Jerusalem and Israel. And they will sit with Abraham and Isaac in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom, who's that? That's Israel, will be cast out into outer darkness. So there Jesus is clearly teaching it is not enough for someone to be ethnically Jewish of the physical seed of Jacob. They must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus predicted this, but this should keep us humble in our attitude. Now let's go back, um, go back to Romans 11 and let's uh, just read these verses, make sure we understand them. Verse 16, if the first fruit be holy, Romans eleven sixteen, the lump is also holy. Now what in the world? If the root be holy, so are the branches. Okay, he's talking about lumps and roots, fruits and branches. Okay, <laughs> so who's the root and who's the lump? So he says, if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also. Okay, so here's the picture. Here's an offering that they're going to give to the Lord. And here's a whole big, it's dough that they're going to make cakes, you know, and, but they're going to offer to the Lord. So they're going to take, they're going to take some of it and offer it as a first fruit. So they're going to take a, a handful from the whole lump. That's the first fruit. The first fruit be holy. The lump is also holy. So that's the first part of it. Okay. And the root and the branches, we understand that. If, if the root is good, the fruit is good. That's verse 16. But the question then is, what's the first fruit and what's the root? What does it relate to? Okay, so let's look at, go, look at Weir's B. And page... Page 139. Page 139. Does everybody have a, I have an extra book here. Does everybody have a book? Oh, and I actually meant to read this on page 139. Wiersbe asks a really good question, like the third line from the top. He says, if an unsaved Jew visited the average church service, would he be provoked to jealousy? And wish he had what we have, or would he just be provoked? <laughs> okay, so then he talks about the lump of dough at the bottom of page 139, the very last paragraph. He says, applying this to the history of Israel, we understand Paul's argument. God accepted the founder of the nation, Abraham, and in so doing, set apart his descendants as well. God also accepted the other patriarchs, Isaac and Jacob, in spite of their sins and failings. This means that God must accept the rest of the lump, the nation of Israel. So I agree with Wiersbe here. So the first fruit of verse 16 and the, the root refers to, and here's the blank letter A, Israel's founders or the patriarchs, like who? Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Now when it says holy, if they be holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. Holy here means set apart, called. Was Abraham called by God? Yes. Did God clearly call Isaac to inherit the blessing from Abraham? Did God clearly call Jacob then to be the descendant who would inherit the blessing from Isaac? And in other words, that the Messiah would come from through Abraham, through Isaac, and then through Jacob. Yes, we see that in the book of Genesis, 
that the seed would come out of Abraham, then Isaac, and then Jacob. God called them. God called them. In, that, in other words, he set them apart. They were holy. And because Jacob was then set apart and called, we could say that Israel is, as a nation, set apart by God and holy. doesn't mean they're all saved. It means that they're nationally called his nation. And he has a plan for national Israel. He says, if the root be holy, so are the branches. Again, we have to distinguish between that they've been set apart for a purpose. Yes. Does that mean they're all saved? No. But the point here is the first fruit in the root referred to Israel's founders, the patriarchs. They were called by God. And the lump and branches refers to the nation of Israel, to the entire nation of Israel. Okay, so that's letter A. Are you with me on that? Israel's founders and the lump and branches refer to the entire nation of Israel. That's verse 16. Okay, any questions on that? Does that make sense? So if the first fruit be holy, that is Abraham, if he's truly set apart by God, then the rest of the nation is also set apart. If the root be holy, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, so are the branches. Verse 17, and if some of the branches be broken off, and those being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, okay, so now he's talking about the branches of Israel broken off. What, have, what has he been talking about? They've fallen. They've been defeated. They've been cast aside. They've rejected. Remember, that was chapter, chapter 9 was Israel's election. Chapter 10 is Israel's, I'm sorry, chapter 9 was Israel's election. They're his elect people. Chapter 10 is Israel's national rejection. Chapter 11 is their salvation. So he's saying if some of those branches be broken off, that is some of the Israelite people have rejected the Messiah. And you, he's talking to who now? The Gentiles in the Roman church, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them. So who's the wild olive tree? The Gentiles. I don't have a blank for that, but you might want to put that in somewhere that the wild olive tree are the Gentiles. The olive branches is Israel. That's letter B. The olive branches are Israel. And then the wild olive, the, the wild uh, olive tree there being a wild olive tree. That would be the Gentiles were grafted in among them. And, you know, they say that uh, an olive tree lives to be very old, but sometimes when it gets old, I'm not, I'm not a botanist, I don't know, I just read this. So um, that when an olive tree gets really old, it doesn't bring forth the fruit. So they would take young olive branches and graft in young branches amongst the older branches. So that, because the olive tree is still, you know, still a tree, it's still got a good root. So they graft in the younger branches. So that's kind of the idea. But the but where's the mercy of verse 17? Where's the mercy? He doesn't graft in necessarily good olive branches. He grafts in what? The wild. Now that could mess up the tree. They say if you graft in the wild olive branches, that the wild takes over the good. You know? So this is God's mercy. To, this is God's mercy. And this should keep us what? The main point here? Humble and thankful. As our sister said earlier, thankful, humble, and attitude that we Gentiles partake or participate in the blessing of God's covenant promises. We enjoy the salvation of the Messiah. And just as a branch does not provide food and water for the root, so the Gentiles have received their spiritual food and nourishment from the nation of Israel. We have the Bible because of the nation of Israel, humanly speaking. It's a Jewish book. And salvation is of the Jew, Jesus himself said. Now, these verses, he's talking about some, so some of those olive branches were broken off. And now he says in verse 18, not to do what? Verse 18 says, what's the first two words? Boast not. In other words, be humble. Oh, just because you've been grafted in now, we can't, we have nothing to boast in, right? We cannot rejoice in our flesh. It's by the grace of God. 
he says that boast not against the branches. Don't, don't have an attitude against the branches that have been diminished, that have fallen off or broken and broken off. But if you boast, thou, you, you bear not the root. The root still bears us. And then he says, thou wilt say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because if, of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith only by grace through faith be not high-minded that is don't be proud be humble but fear now verse 21 for if god spared not the natural branches that's who that's israel if, if god didn't spare them if god cut them off and they've been defeated nationally they if god has done that he says take heed lest he also spare not you so now that leads us to this question, and that's letter D here. Paul is not teaching that one can lose their salvation from these verses. Because it, it almost sounds like, okay, the Jewish people were locked off, and if we don't watch ourselves, we could be cut off too, you know. But is he talking about you individually, or is he talking about a people corporately? See, I see he's talking about like a people corporately, he's talking about a national Israel. So there's no individual Jewish person who has been saved that's going to lose their salvation. And there's no individual Gentile who has been saved who's going to lose their salvation. But have there been churches that started well and became apostate or have fallen away? And in a sense, they've been cut off. That church is, is a branch cut off now. So how does that work? Well, let's say, there, and I'll, I'll, we're Baptists, so I'll just pick on Baptists, all right? So here, here's a Baptist church that started preaching the Bible, but yet unbelief started to creep into that church, and there, this has happened in all denominations, Baptists included. And so, and, and so some people started, ah, the Bible's not the word of God. Jesus isn't born of a virgin. He doesn't necessarily have to be the only way. And this church starts to accept members like that. Now, are there people in that church that are saved at that time? Yeah, there's some people who are saved, but then it becomes a mixture. But then the unbelievers grow more and more, and the true believers die off, and they're not replaced. And then after a while, the church is filled with pretty much all unbelief. Now, maybe there's even a few believers in a church like that. There could be. I believe there's true believers in various denominations that might not necessarily be all true to the faith but but nevertheless there's a lot of apostasy like that in america i believe amongst gentiles amongst the denominations um, in in the name of christianity you know and and so i think that's how it works so i, I don't think he's talking about individual believers but i think that sometimes corporately whether it's a church or whether it's even a a, a people, whatever, you know, they can be cut off. So he's saying to us to be humble. That's that's how I see that. I don't know. Is there any questions or comments? I know the whole issue of losing your salvation, that you know, there is some disagreement about that. <laughs> but I'm I'm very convinced that when one is born of the Spirit, one is kept by the power of God unto salvation. And somebody truly saved. As the Lord said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. I don't believe you can lose eternal life. Otherwise, it wouldn't be eternal. It would be temporary. <laughs> he didn't save us with temporary life. He saved us to eternal life. So, you know, that, that's my, my understanding on that. So, I, I don't believe Paul's teaching you can lose your salvation. Wearsby agrees. If you look on page uh, 140 at the top there, page 140, Oh, my. I didn't know it was after 9 o'clock. I'm sorry. I didn't even look at the clock. Wow. Okay. I'm going to give you the blanks, and then we'll be done. Let me read this. This is a symbol of the nation of Israel. And he says, please keep in mind that Paul was not discussing the relationship of individual believers to God, but the place of Israel in the plan of God. Okay, so he's talking about the nation of Israel. All right, let me give you the letter. Number three is be reverent. Don't be high-minded, but fear. That is, have a, a fear of God. Two contrasting, I'm going to give you these blanks on page 12. The goodness, 
The two contrasting characteristics are goodness of God and the severity of God. I'm on page, the very bottom of 11 is be reverent, where he says fear. Oh, I'm sorry. At the very bottom, I'm sorry. You know what? I have different. Uh, the very bottom of 11 is goodness. So three is be reverent. Three is be reverent. I'm sorry for the confusion. Three is be reverent. And then under letter C, number one is goodness. That's at the bottom of page 11? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And then on the top of page 12 is severity, the sternness of God. So God shows his goodness and his severity in all of this. And then number four is our responsibility is to be faithful. To be faithful. That's number four. And then you can attach that to the verses. God is, and that, and then he finishes this. Look at verse 23. God is able to graph them in again. And he says, if God could graft us, wild Gentiles, wild branches, into the tree, can't he graft in Jewish people again? Yes, he can, and he will. All Israel will be saved.